So I want to welcome everybody to the Amherst Community Chat for Thursday, April 29th. Today we have back um, some special guests who were with us a couple months ago, I want to say. Uh, we have Library Director Sharon Sherry. Welcome. And I'm going to, we're going to test my recall on the last names here, pronunciation-wise. Uh, oh. <laughs> Jones Library Trustee Alex Lefebvre. And um, <laughs> Capital Campaign Chair Kent Ferber. Great. Okay, good. I passed that initial test. Um, my name is Brianna Sunred, communications manager for the town, and also with us is your town manager, Paul Balkelman. Before we get started talking about the library project, some updates and answering your questions, um, I'm going to ask Paul if he has any general town updates he wants to share. Sure. So, um... There's a lot of happening in town right now. Uh, our focus of energy for the last few weeks, uh, especially more intensively, has been preparing the budget. Uh, the the uh, finance department and I will be presenting the budget overview to the town council on Monday, May 3rd. Uh, from then there, the town council will, will refer it to the finance committee of the town council. And they will meet basically twice a week to start going through uh, line by line, department by department, everything that's in the budget uh, in an, uh, anticipation of making a recommendation back to the full town council in June at some point. The town council has to approve the budget by the end of June. So it's an exciting um, time for us. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's especially a lot of work this year because our new finance director, Sean Mangano, has really restructured the budget and it's, it looks much more up to date and, and um, but when you take something that you haven't done and start doing it a new way, it creates a lot of uh, challenges. And um, and Sean has been working with Brianna to really uh, make it much more engaging and more interesting for people to relate to so they can access the information in an easier way. So a ton of work being done, but I'm really excited by the end product that's, that we're going to deliver to the uh, community on Monday. So there's a lot of other stuff happening. The um, vaccination clinics continue uh, for the first time. And we just were on a meeting with uh, UMass on this. We're noticing that there are more appointments. Uh, there, there are more, there's more vaccine than there are appointments. And so that's a great news story because we're starting to see the very beginning stages of, that, of the supply um, out, outstepping the, um, the need. So we want that to be continue. Uh, but people should be realized that uh, there are vaccine appointments available both at UMass and at the town when when we post them to go on and you can try and sign up for them. Uh, so we're seeing that throughout the state. We're not alone in that, but it's a, it's a really good news story. So those are the two big things. There's, you know, of course, public health and, um, um, and the budget. Great. Thank you, Paul, for that update. And I want to take the, the chance for um, our live attendees, both in in Zoom and on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to post your comments. In Zoom, you can do that in Q&A, comments or questions. In Zoom, you can additionally raise your hand and we can hear from you live. So just a, a quick reminder on that. Um, so feel free to chime in at any point with your questions. But I think where we'll start is just asking Sharon, can you tell us where this project stands today? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having us. And uh, so I, I want to give a quick nod to so that everybody understands there is a there was a, a, a court hearing uh, Wednesday. And um, so we're we're aware that that we're waiting for a decision from the judge. Uh, but in the meantime, we are we're continuing to move forward on the project because um, there's a lot to do and and the days matter, that they make a difference. So what I wanted to do is um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk about the timeline. Uh, I'm going to give a, a brief overview. So I'm hoping you all can see that. Um, let me start. Let me start over here. So here, here are the different phases that will, that will occur uh, during the next two, three years uh, under project schedule. So let me walk you through this a little bit. Um, under So number one uh, is the concept designs and feasibility study, which uh, we're, we're done with that. Um, and so we're automatically starting at, at phase two, which is the design phase. Um, 
And what we do during this phase is we're looking at uh, contracting again with the OPM colliers and, and the architect, uh, Feingold Alexander Architects. And we will work on completing the schematics. Uh, we will work on moving from schematics into the design development phase. And, and that during that phase is where the, the, the designs become more, more specific and more accurate. Um, and that phase leads up to uh, the contract document phase. And those documents are very, very important um, because that's kind of where change orders um, are born. Um, because when, when mistakes are made, the contractors, they, they, they seize that moment uh, to initiate so, so, some change orders. So um, I think this is why having an excellent architect and, and OPM is so important. And it just so happens we do. Um, so that whole process is looking like in, in this schedule, to, to, it's the blue line here, it's about 13 months. And, and so one of the things I wanna say is this entire timeline is very fluid. Uh, so many things can change, so many things will change. So this is our, our best guess, guess right now. Then we will move into phase three, which is um, the bidding phase. Uh, this, this will take about three months. Here's, here's the orange line here. Um, we'll be advertising the project. We'll be having walkthroughs of the building with the potential bidders. Um, ultimately, we'll be choosing a, a general contractor and, and being issued a building permit. And that leads us to the construction phase, which is this entire uh, red line here, which is scheduled to take about 23 months right now. Um, again, it's fluid. Uh, some things could take longer, some things could, uh, could go quicker. Uh, but during this phase, the library will be uh, providing all of its services just somewhere else. Uh, we, we are still in the process of, of finding an inter interim location. And I, I have a feeling there, there will be more than one interim location. We'll certainly be able to utilize the two branches more. We'll be able to extend those open hours, um, but stay tuned for more information on that. Once we finish construction or, or towards the end of construction, that's when we move into the FFNE phase, uh, which is the furniture, fixtures, and equipment phase. Um, that's kind of like the fun part. You know, you start to make the building pretty and, and the furniture gets moved in and, and um, you know, the, the technology is, is installed. A certificate of occupancy is then issued. The staff start moving back in and, and eventually there's a grand opening. Um, Number six is the closeout phase. And that's, if I move this guy, that's um, these three little these three little months here, you know, that's closing out the contract documents and uh, issuing final reports to the MBLC and, and, and getting as-built drawings and, you know, starting on the punch list kind of a thing. So that's what, that, that's a quick overview of the timeline. Um, happy to take questions. We, thank you, Sharon. I, I think that visual is going to be really helpful for people, at least uh, it was for me to, to see the timeline. There is a question in the room. I don't think it's re um, relating to the project itself, but in general, um, this attendee wants to know when the libraries will reopen. And I'm not sure if that's right now or based on the project, but I guess maybe if you want to Oh, good point. Oh, so so for right now, for 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 COVID goings on, we are looking at we're working with the staff. We've got some HVAC issues that we're having to work out. Um, we're we're having some repairs done. Um, so regarding reopening now, um, I'm not sure. It would be lovely. Um, what can I, what should I say? I should say, attend the next PPP committee meeting, which is on May 7th, which is a Friday. Uh, and that's when uh, we will be uh, showing our, our proposed plan to the trustees. And that will start the, the conversation again. But regarding when we will reopen after construction, it's looking like the uh, grand opening celebration would happen in FY24, give or take. Um, that's the best I can do right now. Thank you. And I can add on to Sharon about reopening during COVID. One of the biggest things that we're struggling with is I'm sure everybody knows 
one of the reasons for the renovation and expansion is our outdated HVAC system. And so when we had an air exchange rate study done, what we found um, is that shockingly, uh, not shockingly, our systems aren't working. Um, and so we are unable to do the air exchange rates that are required or recommended um, for people to safely be in the building. And so remedying that um, is not easy. It can be costly as well as it's requiring us to seek some funds to get air purifiers. So there's, um, so a lot of it has to do with the, the condition of the building in our HVAC systems and how much we can remedy that affordably to figure out how to open um, uh, as much as we can. Great, thank you, Alex. So if anybody has questions who's um, viewing live, feel free to chime in about the timeline or anything else. Um, you Sharon, guys, you meant, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. But, but you do have a, a, the, the tent up in front of the library. Is that gonna become operational soon? Yeah, so uh, we started um, manning the tent, I, I wanna say the beginning of April. So uh, we're offering computer internet services out there in the in the afternoons and it's dependent on the weather. So this afternoon may not be a great day for that. Um, but yes, and, and staff are working on, even when we start to open the library uh, to patrons, we're talking about continuing to use the tent for programming, ESL, you know, tutoring that can go on. Um, so we'll definitely be utilizing in that tent more and more. Do people need a library card to access the, um, the computer services that will be there during good weather days or how does that work? Oh, fabulous question. No, um, if you have one, that's great. We can use it to, to reserve and, and log on. But if you don't have one, we have passes that we can give you and you can log on. That's great. So Sharon, you mentioned earlier about staying involved in the process of when the library reopens kind of right now, um, but how can people stay involved during the process of the library project? I, I'm actually gonna have, I'm gonna hand that over to Alex because she wants to talk a little bit about community engagement. Mm. Perfect. Thanks, no, that's a great question. So as Sharon said, the next phase of the project is design development. And so during design development phase, the schematics, which is what we have now, which are a preliminary drawing, are fleshed out, enhanced with the goal of creating a final design that we would take out for bid and construction. And so design development is where any changes that have been made to the original design are implemented, and it includes selection of materials, both on the interior and exterior, as well as furnishings, fixtures, things like that. And so for us, one measure of success for the library project is that everyone in the community feels drawn to and welcome at this newly renovated and expanded library. And so we wanna make sure that we're seeing uh, an actual rise in our usership and hopefully from populations that previously felt excluded or unable to use its services. And so the community engagement piece is gonna be really important during this phase of the project. Um, and one of the things that's great about the library is that we have already a lot of great relationships with different parts of the community and using those relationships and partnerships to create community engagement is a really nice way to make sure that everybody's involved. But we also wanna make sure that we are creating community engagement with perhaps the populations who aren't being served currently. Um, and so we're looking at building on our existing relationships but also seeking out those new opportunities and through partnerships like we are working on right now through the schools and through the survival center and through um, the literacy project, using those organizations as a method for us to be able to communicate with populations that maybe wouldn't come to an open session of come tell us what you wanna hear. And so we're trying to really look at the engagement process through a different lens, right? How do we continue to partner with diverse organizations? How do we choose venues and processes that are specific to the groups we're trying to reach and have a welcoming atmosphere? How do we increase accessibility? How do we develop alternative methods for engagement? And then how do we maintain our presence within the community? So I, I think we have some really great um, things that I'm excited about for community engagement. And I hope that it looks um, maybe a little different from what community engagement has looked like in the past um, so that we can get the broadest population um, possible, telling us how we can be the best partner and provide the services they need and where they walk in the door and feel like they're home and like they get what they need from the town and from its library. And, and 
Deanna, can I add something? Oh, please there's do, Ken. There's a very, very important way you can become involved going forward, which is to help us pay for it. Uh, this is a really remarkable project in that the town taxpayers are only coming up with about 40% of the cost of it. We have this huge grant from the MBLC, but we're asking the community to supply about six and a half million dollars of it. And we've got a capital campaign going. If you wanna participate, uh, go to joneslibrary.org. There's a donate button right prominently up there in the red bar at the top, and it takes you right to a page with a box that allows you to download the pledge form. If you wanna, obviously that's a quick and easy way to get involved. Uh, we have all kinds of needs because raising that six million requires the work of a lot more than just me or a few of us. We've got a committee of about 19 people working on it. We're doing very well. We've raised about, uh, well, about $2 million, a little more than $2.2 .2 million, $1.2 in pledges from community members, a million dollar CPA grant. We just wrote an application for a grant for another $1.1 million because we can't stop now because if we stop we will miss grant deadlines and we really don't want to do that and the council has spoken as far as we're concerned we got to move ahead uh, the community has been very generous so far but we got a large hill to climb and could use all the help we can get uh, we have some very generous we have about 90 commitments so far um, 77 of them for a thousand dollars or more Payments are, we're asking for pledges over payable over five years. They're all still conditional on this project going forward, but uh, these people are ready to go. So if you want to help us, um, go on the webpage and donate and fill out a pledge form, or you can contact me, kwferber at comcast.net or friends of the Jones at uh, gmail.com. Thank you, Ken. I mean, I think that's a great lead into our next question is talking a little bit about the project budget. And I think Alex might have some points on this um, from the point of view of staying within the budget um, and also referencing the, the capital campaign a little bit more as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I just also want to circle back on community engagement around the fact that we had, I think, almost what was it, like 270 people wrote into town council about this project. And that's a really large number of people to write in about any one project. And, you know, 72% of that were in favor of the project. And so I think the community is engaged um, mm -hmm. and will continue to be engaged, which is great. And so just harnessing that so that we can now get feedback on the building is the next step. Um, around budget numbers, so the... So we're required by the state to have an owner project manager, which most people may or may not be familiar with. Um, and there's a state designer selection process for choosing your OPM, which is what we did with Collier's. Um, and the OPM's job is to represent the library. So that is our person who helps us negotiate contracts, monitor timelines, handles the invoice and payments resolves site and design issues, coordinates communication. And so that's our real uh, independent person working on behalf of the town and the library to make sure that we're staying within our budget. And so the actual estimated budget for the MBLC grant was created by this OPM um, when we had the year long delay because of COVID. Again, the OPM was the one who went back and looked at the budget to make sure that the project was still doable. And so the project goes through several design phases. The first was schematic, we just completed, then design development, construction documents, bidding, and then actual construction. And at the end of each phase, a cost estimate is done by the design team. And then a second independent cost estimate is completed by the OPM team. And then those two estimates are reconciled to make sure we have a clear picture of where mm -hmm. we are in the project. And at that point is when the OPM will come to us and say, hey, you need to make decisions because maybe we're getting a little too close to our budget. And so that's where they'll look at ads or, you know, do you really need the rolling bookshelves or can we do, you know, so that's where those decisions will be made along the way. Um, so their job is to make sure that we have uh, cost certainty and that we are on budget. Um, and this is an experienced OPM team. So I feel very confident that we uh, are going to move forward and have a beautiful building and um, be on budget. 
And does the OPM stay with you for the life of the project or do they come in at certain intervals for key decisions or are they with us? I have, until... I'm, I'm making up the spare bedroom upstairs. <laughs> they're, they're We're moving in. <laughs> they're all in. <laughs> That's well, great. Thank to, you. To reiterate, the big picture is that um, the trustees are going to come up with 6.6 .6 million. The MBLC is coming up with 13.8, uh, and that leaves the town bill at 15.8 for a 36 million dollar project. All right, I'm gonna do another call for our live attendees if they wanted to pop in a question. Again, it doesn't have to be related to the project um, specifically, but if you have another library or town related question, feel free to go ahead and use the Q&A or raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and the same goes for our Facebook live viewers who are tuning in. Feel free to put a comment in and I can read it to the group. And, and while we're waiting, I'd love to give a shout out for some of the creative programming that's happening at the library. There's a collaboration, two collaborations with the Survival Center. One is um, going to be uh, cooking out of your, you know, what's what's in your pantry box that you're getting from the Survival Center. And the other is um, like a poetry reading. And um, the idea is to have people speaking uh, in their own languages, in their own voice, not looking for professional poets, um, just a community building. Um, if you've ever watched the Moth Radio Hour you know, on NPR, think of that kind of thing. So there's some really incredible new programs happening at the library that I am personally am super excited about and want to advertise. <laughs> We do have um, a hand in the room and also a question that came into the Q&A. So I'd love to invite um, Tony to come on in and unmute and introduce yourself and um, feel free to go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thanks so much for letting me um, speak today. I just joined in, so I'm sorry if you um, have already said this. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I just caught the last part there where Mr. Ferber said about the uh, timeline and the budget um, being set at 36.3. I did notice at the recent trustees meeting, um, Director Shari presented a timeline that shows a much longer project duration than had been shared with the council. And uh, one part is it begins six months later than the council had been told and it ends a year later. Um, and you also wrote in your um, letters that each year adds 1.6 million to the cost. So since it is one year longer than was initially proposed, surely that 1.6 million has already been added to the cost. And if so, um, how will we know what has to be cut in the budget in order to keep to the 36.3 if the cost is indeed 1.6 million more. Um, will, we, will we see some sort of analysis that shows what's going to be cut in order to keep to that budget? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Tony. Does anyone feel moved specifically to answer that one? So yeah, really all I can do is say, so the timeline is very fluid uh, when it begins and when it ends. So um, I, I wouldn't say that the project cost has escalated yet. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so um, this is one of the reasons that we have an OPM and, and because of the budget, um, they will be working very hard to get us through the design development and, and, um, and, and bid phase as quickly as possible so that we can still be um, uh, on our original target date. Um, and it, as far as uh, what, what has to get cut along the way, definitely that will all be made public when it happens. And, and I would also add, I, I, I don't know the year difference discrepancies that, that Tony's referring to, um, but what I do know is that uh, what was presented to town council was done in conjunction with the OPM and the budget that we're looking at is done with the OPM and this timeline that is being presented now is done with the OPM. So there is a consistency in terms of the OPM being on budget and the timeline. And as Sharon has said, 
you know, if, 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 if we wait a month, the whole timeline shifts. If we get through design development in two months rather than six months, the timeline shifts. If we, you know, this, it's, it's I, I would urge people to not be rigid around the timeline because that's not how they work. The, the only rigidity are, is the MBLC payments. And even that isn't rigid beyond fiscal years, um, but it's still tied to things. So I would just urge people to move away from rigidity and understand it's a, it's a process. Great, thank you. We have another um, question that came into the Q&A. Um, would Paul explain why town council has to appropriate the full project cost when the town will only pay a part? This has confused people. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great question, Sarah. Um, so it's one of these things with local government finance that we have to appropriate the full amount and one of the reasons the council structured the um, council order the way they did is they wanted to be very transparent to people. They wanted to show how much was coming from the town, how much was coming from the MBLC, how much was coming from CPA, and how much was uh, the, the library trustees were responsible for fundraising for. So they, um, un they tried to put that in the order, a little chart that showed that because they knew that was going to be a confusing vote for folks. And I thought that was a, a smart thing for them to have done. But it's one of those things where we have to borrow, the, we have to authorize the borrowing up front. It doesn't mean we're going to borrow all that money because the MBLC program acts in a little bit different way than the MSBA program in that they give funds, some of the funds up front, which means we don't have to borrow those funds. But we had, we are required to authorize uh, the borrowing so we could move the project forward. That probably made it more confusing, but that's just, it's just one of these things of how local government finance works. And we're still waiting for your Schoolhouse Rock episode on public finance. So we'll share that when it's ready. Um, so we're coming up, it, time flies. We've got about three minutes before wow. our end time. And I just wanna give um, any other of our live attendees a uh, last chance to, to share your comments or questions with our um, special guests. And uh, while we wait for that, I would love to invite our special guests if they have um, a last call to action or a last piece of information that they wanted to share relating to this project or the library in general, feel free to go ahead and do that now. Um, whoever wants to start, Alex. Well, I just wanna give a huge shout out to Kent and Lee and the whole campaign uh, committee. Um, you know, they didn't even, put in their campaign finance this newest grant that they've just applied for, for $1.1 .1 million. We may get it, we may not, but they have been just tireless um, in terms of tracking down grants and opportunities to fund this uh, program. And the reality is none of this would be happening without the efforts of those people. And I just, I don't think they get enough accolades. And I just, it's really incredible. Everybody in that group, thank you. So push that donate button. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is a great project. This is a transformative project for this town. And there's a whole lot of people excited about it. And we can make it happen. Yeah, and I just want to throw in that, that uh, this builds on a lot of um, energy just being built around town. You know, the town council also approved mm -hmm. and will again be looking at the parking uh, requests for the North Common. And we've, uh, we're anxious to get additional funds that we're seeking to um, uh, uh, fix roads around the Common as well. So I think people are gonna see a lot of investment in downtown. We have our new uh, playground at Kendrick Park. And I'm, we're looking at a lot of investment in the downtown area, plus other parts of town, Pomeroy Village, for instance, getting a new intersection there. There's a lot happening in town and, um, and it's a real investment in things that matter uh, to our community. So there's more to come. We're working on funding sources for all of these things. Um, so it's not all on, the, all on the burdens of the local taxpayers. So a lot of effort being done to, to seek out grants and substantial grants at that. And, and Sharon, any, any final uh, words you want to leave our audience with? So not having to do with the building project, uh, I do want to give a shout out to the library staff. Uh, Alex, you did a little bit, but oh my gosh, what they have done and accomplished over this past year has been extraordinary. I mean, I happen to think that all Town of Amherst employees are awesome, but, <laughs> but the library employees are especially awesome. So just, I want to thank all of them. Thank you. 
All right. Well, I don't see any additional questions in our room, so I, I do want to take the chance to say thank you to our special guests, Alex, Kent, and Sharon, for sharing uh, your time with us. We're going to have this up on our community chat uh, playlist on YouTube, as well as our social media channels. So if you want to um, share it with friends, it will be up there shortly. So thank you all. Thank you. Have a great thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.